afternoon, family. <laughs> I am Alicia Porter, CDF Minnesota State Director, and it is my honor to introduce Olivia Golden as our advocate for joy, CDF advocate for joy. Olivia is currently serving as the interim executive director at CLASP, where she previously led as executive director from 2013 to 2022. Her lifelong dedication to enhancing the lives of children and families and her unwavering commitment to racial and economic justice are matched by her proven ability to deliver impactful results at federal, state, and local levels of government as well as in the nonprofit sector. For the past two years, Olivia has consulted on policy advocacy and leadership development, including serving as senior policy advisor to the Foundation for Child Development. Her recent work, Cutting Child Poverty in Half and More, co-authored by Vivian Singh, reflects her deep insights into leveraging pandemic era federal policies to build a future strategy rooted in equity and justice. Throughout her career, Olivia has held numerous impactful roles, including Commissioner for Children, Youth, and Families, and later as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 1993 to 2001. During her tenure, she was instrumental in expanding and improving Head Start and creating Early Head Start reforming public benefit programs, significantly increasing funding for child care, and doubling adoptions from foster care. As a fellow at the Urban Institute, she led major initiatives focused on poverty, economic security, and children's well-being. Her leadership in transforming the DC Children and Family Services Agency from federal court receivership to a model agency stands as a testament to her commitment to public service. Olivia has also contributed her expertise as New York's Director of State Operations, as a lecturer at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, and as a former Director of Programs and Policy here at Children's Defense Fund. A scholar and thought leader, Olivia holds a doctorate and a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she also earned her bachelor's degree in philosophy and government. Her written works, including Reforming Child Welfare and Poor Children and Welfare Reform, demonstrate her deep understanding of the systematic changes needed to uplift the most vulnerable families. We are delighted to honor Olivia Golden for her incredible contributions and her unyielding advocacy for the well-being and dignity of children and families everywhere. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Olivia Golden a CDF advocate for joy. Wow, thank you so much. Um, it, it really means a lot. It's really, this, this is an amazing moment. I've been thinking about these remarks for weeks, ever since um, Dr. Wilson asked me to come and told me about the award. And, but I didn't actually start working on them till yesterday. And it made me think um, many years ago, um, back when I was Assistant Secretary for Children and Families, so a lot of decades ago, I was giving a speech in Kansas City, and I got on the plane from DC, like a four-hour flight, plenty of time to write a speech, right? Four-hour flight. I started, I'm scribbling, you know, back then, the lined paper, the pen, scribbling away. We get to the other end, they say, fold up the tray tables, prepare for landing, perfect timing. I, pen touches the paper the last time, put the pen away, put the paper pad away, and the young man sitting next to me, who I hadn't noticed the whole time, said to me, ma'am, isn't that a little like doing your homework on the school bus? <laughs> so yes, it actually is. Um, but the reason for the writer's block on these remarks was that it means so much to me. CDF was my first job in Washington, D.C. more than 30 years ago, 1991 to 93, 
and it had a fundamental effect on my life and career. And I've talked to so many of you for whom that's true for you also, even though it's a lot more recent. CDF, for one thing, was my first experience working for a black leader, and it jump-started for me a lifelong journey of a deeper commitment to learn about black history and culture in the United States and its impact on the present. For another, Marion Wright Edelman's vision of a child advocacy that centers children and parents and communities and makes all those connections and sees child advocacy as a pathway to economic and racial justice, that really resonated with me and has affected my whole career since. And finally, her deep commitment to both practical incremental steps, making the changes you can make every day, and a big vision has really, that's meant a lot to me. And all the times when people try to play those two things against each other and say you can either be vision for vision or you can be for incremental but not both, she didn't have patience for that. She cared about both. I wrote about some of these core lessons from Marion as a tribute to her in, in 2019 when she got an honorary degree from NYU Law School. That was, of course, during the Trump administration, and I thought about those lessons in that moment. Now, with this invitation, um, I really wanted to think about those lessons in today's moment. So I want to come back to talk a little more deeply about why I think those ideas resonate, if anything, more than ever. But I want to start by telling you briefly where I think we are today in this moment. And I understand for staff that you've been thinking a lot about that in the retreat. So perhaps this is another voice for you to think about. From my perspective, which is now more than 40 years in this work, this is an incredibly high stakes moment for children and for the country, perhaps the most high stakes in my lifetime in terms of the divergence between the different paths that we could be going down. The organization I head now, Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP, um, has a tax status of 501c3, which for those of you who do this work, you know that that means we can't be involved in political activity. So I'm going to talk to you not about politics, but about policy um, and about the differences between the policies of the Biden-Harris administration and Vice President Harris's views when she was in the Senate, on the one hand, and the policies of the Trump administration on the other. I'm not going to talk about the campaigns. You can add that in your heads. Um, so in terms of the policies and why I think this fork in the road is so extreme, under the Biden-Harris administration, and you just heard about that paper that I wrote with, with Vivian Tseng, through the different policies, the different laws that were passed, the American Rescue Plan, among the pieces of CDF's vision for children that were there, there was a big um, investment in income for families with young children. The policy term is the refundable, expanded and refundable child tax credit. What that meant, many of you know, was getting money to families, especially families with young children, and to all families, including those with the least income, not a policy targeted only at the middle class. But in addition to that expansion of money, there were expansions in nutrition assistance, summer, SNAP program, expansions in health, in housing, and reducing homelessness, all targeted at, at children and families. And really the closest approach to the CDF vision for children and families in my lifetime. And it worked. We, terrible things happened in the pandemic. But in the midst of it, we cut child poverty in half as a nation from 2019 to 2021 in two years, including black and Latino children. It never happened before. The lowest levels the United States has ever seen. Right before the pandemic, the National Academy of Sciences brought together a zillion researchers to make the case that it would be a good thing for the country to cut child poverty, which everybody in this room already knew, but they brought together lots of researchers to quantify it. And they said, yes, the US should try to cut child poverty in half, and it was doable in 10 years. We did it in two years, not in 10 years. And that's just really quite an extraordinary set of policies. 
In the Trump administration, I was at class, uh, leading class. Many of you, we were in many different places. You'll remember where you were then. Trump administration tried to roll back the core health care programs, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, didn't succeed, but tried. Um, sent tax cuts to the wealthy and to corporations, not to families. And perhaps most frightening to me and, and a big area of, of work that we partnered with CDF when I was at class, and with CDF Texas. Who's here from CDF Texas? Great. Um, they placed a huge target on the backs of immigrant families, and also black families and other families of color, but with immigrant families in particular, the administration tried to cut off access of everybody, including citizen children, to healthcare, to nutrition, even at the beginning to Head Start, to schooling. They didn't succeed. The coalition that so many of you were part of, along with hundreds of organizations, fought back, and eventually it took us till early in the Biden administration, but we stopped it. But the terror remained, the terror that to this day holds families back from getting the help their kids need. And then the effects on black young people, again, many of you lived it. At CDF, we wrote a paper called Unjustice, about the ways in which the Trump administration's Justice Department, both in words and in actions, targeted black and brown young people. So these are really opposite visions for children and families. And that's why I say it's an incredibly high stakes moment. But as advocates and as organizers, that has to energize us, not paralyze us, right? We have to live with uncertainty and figure out what we're going to do about it, be ready to advance the vision, to defend victories. We've really learned victories take defending, right? Many of you knew that, but you don't just win them once. Um, and then organize children and families who are involved. But we don't come to this moment with a blank slate. And I just want to highlight that to me, one of the elements that's powerful for all of us in this nation about centering black leadership is there are so many elders and so many people in this room, Alita and I were just talking about her history and experiences in Mississippi, but there are so many black leaders who've been here before and who have wisdom to offer everybody else and lessons. And I would say that even for those of us who are not elders, or I guess at this point I'm starting to be, but for people who've been paying attention mostly in the last eight or 10 years, we come to this moment with a huge amount of lessons learned. From the Trump years, we learned about coalitions. I guess we knew it before, but it just became so evident that nobody can fight back alone. We're in this together. We learned how to document the harm, the danger, so that we can fight back and, re, re, and repeal, you know, keep the damage at bay. And we learned how to keep the vision alive and how to fight back against deliberate fear and misinformation, because those are tactics, right? Those are strategies and tactics. I was actually hearing about successfully fighting back on the local level in Knoxville against tactics of fear. Again, it's something you have in your experiences. From these last four years, I would say that one of the big things I took away from those policies that I told you about that were passed is that progress that gets us closer to the CDF vision than ever in my life in the United States is possible. And even though we lost it, as you know, that was temporary. We lost those policies in the Congress eventually. It was still a reminder that despair is a really bad thing and that, in fact, that we can get there. We also learned that progress has to be defended and defended again. Um, we lost that child tax credit nationally, but probably a lot of you have been involved in making it, in advancing it in the states. And that's, again, a way of keeping the movement going. And we learned that everybody has a role to play organizers, people advocating in federal and state legislatures, the detailed in the weeds policy wonks, that's some of my colleagues at CLASP, who can really figure out how to tell federal leaders what to do. I, don't get me wrong, we have visionaries at CLASP too, but we have people who really know a great deal about how to write the law. Um, state policy advocates, everybody has a piece of this. So I guess what I wanted to where I wanted to take you to 
um, which Reverend Dr. Wilson asked me to focus on, is, a, is, is CDF's special role going forward. Because even though no organization can do it alone, and I very much believe that, there are some really powerful and important ways that CDF has a special role. And so I want to go back and talk about those three things that I told you my own time at CDF left me with, and that I think are particularly relevant today. And the first thing I said to you was that it was very powerful for me to work for a black leader and in an organization that centered the history of black leadership, the history of black communities in the US, the his and the well-being and future of black children and families, and did so in an expansive way that took those lessons to all children and all communities, particularly those that are threatened or marginalized or endangered. Now, it was powerful for me, but I was just getting an inkling of how powerful it is for other people when I, the, I was telling somebody about this speech at CLASP, and it turned out that she had attended a freedom school for three summers in the 1990s when she was in high school. Yep, see people raising their hands. Um, and then was an intern in CDF, Washington, D.C., her first year in college. She's a black woman, I would say young, but she only seems young to me, I, not really young. And, um, she said it changed her life, and she cited when I asked her how it changed her life, the pride in black history and culture, the creativity that the Freedom Schools unlocked in her, and the emphasis on servant leadership. So that's a really powerful organizing and leadership development tool. I know you know that, but just to underline that, that focus on history and community. It's also, of course, powerful for moral reasons. Justice demands a better future for black children. But I think one of the things I want to say as an older white woman is that it's also a powerful message for the future of the country. Because the majority of children in the US today are black or brown. And so there's no positive future for the United States of America without a positive future for black and brown children. So that's a very powerful and important set of themes for CDF to focus on. I do want to highlight that I think CDF is at its most powerful when it brings the lessons and the core moral values that this racial justice struggle creates to also engage other communities that are deeply threatened. And the place where I've really seen that has been it when in those years, which sadly are, it's happening in the rhetoric now, when immigrant children and families are particularly targeted. One of the reasons I wanted to call out CDF Texas is what terrific partners you've been on the Protecting Immigrant Families campaign, which has focused on fighting back against a particular piece of the attacks of the Trump administration, which was this effort to keep people away from getting health and nutrition and other, other help for their children. And Mrs. Edelman also wrote in her moral commentaries several about the circumstances of immigrant children targeted by xenophobia. So I just think this piece of CDF's core values and core grounding is really powerful. Second of those three themes that I mentioned was child advocacy that's not about children in isolation, but children and parents and caregivers and families and communities and child advocacy as a path to economic and racial justice. Marian always saw child advocacy as important for two somewhat different reasons. The first one, of course, that Children matter, they're vulnerable, it's a moral test of a society, how well it cares for its children. And child policy, child advocacy can be a gateway to the well-being of the broader community. Because we were, we were just talking about this um, over lunch, children can't thrive if their parents don't thrive, if their communities aren't safe, if there isn't health, right? So child advocacy, um, it's not my lesson, it's your lesson. <laughs> I learned it from you. Um, 
But two examples of my time from my time at CDF have always stuck with me. We always did the young parents report. I don't know if you still do that, but I took that idea also to CLASP, where we looked at young child poverty by looking at the data on the parents of young children who are who are young adults and who are not at a time in their lives where they're earning very well. They're suffering the whole set of barriers to their success, and that report made that point very powerfully. But a second one for me was Marion's passion for Head Start, which of course, as you know, I don't actually think it was in the movie, but she began heading Head Start in Mississippi in its, in its first year of existence, first years of existence, under enormous attack and in a program which saw Head Start as a continuation of the civil rights movement. So Head Start with its philosophy of child, family, community, all, all changing together. So when I had the chance to be Assistant Secretary for Children and Families and just the enormous opportunity to be part of the creation of early Head Start for babies and toddlers, I had that vision in my mind and it shaped, I think, what we were able to do. So that focus on children in the context of community, parents, staff, is incredibly current. The organizing for childcare right now, for example, is about parent organizing, organizing on behalf of children and childcare workers. And that's made it more possible to put racial justice front and center, to put worker justice front and center, and to tie these different movements together. It may be new for some people, it's not new for CDF. It's in your bones, it's in your organizational DNA, and that's very powerful. And finally, the third theme that I took from CDF that I think is incredibly relevant right now is this idea of incremental steps on the way to the vision, not pulling those things apart and choosing between vision and action. When I first came to CDF, Marion invited me to a dinner at her home, which she did from time to time. She wanted to pull together people in DC, in Congress, or the administration, or the advocacy world to talk about some issues of interest to her. And I was new to DC. I was very impressed. I was excited about who was I going to meet. The end of the evening, I was nowhere near as impressed with any of the experts, except that I was impressed with Marion. And I just felt very lucky to work for the one person in that room who did not define their vision by what could be passed in that particular Congress, right? She was thinking big. But at the same time, there was another occasion, someone I, a colleague, a, a friend and colleague, asked her where, see what position CDF should take on a particular provision of a health bill that was far from what we had originally hoped for. And Marion said, is it good for children? And my colleague said, yes. And Marion said, well, then we're for it. And so I took away from working for her the belief that advocacy is about making all the practical inc incremental improvements you can. Because children don't wait. Parents' lives don't wait. If you can do something that will make people's lives better, you do it. And you don't stop there. You keep going on the way to the vision. You do as much as you can every day, and you don't stop till you get to the moon, basically. That's a demanding approach, because it means you have to keep taking action. You have to keep trying things. You probably have to keep failing and hitting your head against a brick wall, and then succeeding a little, and then defending it. You don't have the luxury of sitting back and waiting till someday It'll be possible to achieve the whole vision. And you also don't have the luxury of doing it once and saying that's enough, right? You keep doing the work day by day by day by day on the way to the vision. So that's the approach to advocacy that I associate with Marion and with CDF. And I think it is incredibly important in this moment. We know what the vision is. We've actually come pretty close to it once, not all the way. Um, and now we know that wherever we are in this fork in the road, we're going to have to be playing for both whatever success, whatever fighting off of damage we do on the way to the big picture. So I wanted to close with a phrase that everybody here um, who is with CDF long enough to overlap with Marion has surely heard, assign yourself, 
Anybody remember it? Few people remember it, right? What it means is you know where we're going, you know the vision, you know the moment, the high stakes moment, you know CDF strengths, and you know, Marion said that in, the, in that video, you know your own skills, what you bring to it. Now go figure out what you can do. Don't wait for somebody else to assign you, assign yourself. Figure out what needs to be done and do it. I can't think of better words to live by in a really difficult, uncertain, scary moment than assign yourself. And I can't think of a better team to go out and do it than the team here. Thank you so much for this honor. It means so much. <laughs>